Good morning. How's everyone doing? You doing good? God's good. Well, I'll tell you, how many, how many others were in a battle, a war? You know that? Well, today I'm talking about the, the blood of Jesus, and how many know Satan hates the blood of Jesus? He hates it because, uh, why? Uh, Revelation 12.10 says they overcame him, Satan, by what? The blood of the Lamb. So we're talking about the blood, and on the way here, all of a sudden my back just goes <laughs> like that, and just so, so if I fall down, Kevin will come and pick me up. He's awesome. But uh, anyway, but uh, pray for me if you would. But uh, that was kind of how you know. It's just fun getting older, isn't it? Isn't it just great? I tell you, man. I, it's like uh, it's not. Yeah, there you go. No, it's not. But <laughs> anyway, all right. If you're a Bibles, please turn with me to Revelation chapter one, verse four. How many excited to get back into the book of Revelation? Pretty cool. All right, awesome. We uh, had uh, we had Morgan speak, and then we had Mother's Day. And so uh, now we're back in the book of Revelation. Remember, as we read it, that Revelation, as we studied, has a blessing for those who read it and those who hear it. So as I teach from Revelation, I'm reading it, and you're hearing it, you're blessed. How many know it's the only book? Now, you're blessed reading all the Scripture, but how many know this is the only book that says you get a blessing from reading this book specifically? That's pretty cool, huh, man? So we should love that. So you're getting blessed right now, and uh, be excited about that. The title of today's message is The Sevenfold Ministry of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I said that just because it's funny on YouTube, it's the wilder the title is, the more hits you get. And I like to get, I want people to listen to the word, amen. And so you'll see that this isn't, uh, some people take this verse in this passage I'm going to teach from and make it crazy, but I promise I'm not going to do that. So anyways, there's basically four main ways the Christians can view the book of Revelation. I'm going to give you a little overview quickly. Um, kind of a little uh, due diligence. But there's the first view of how to view ve- Revelation is called the preterist view. How many heard of that? Anyone heard of that? Okay, Dwayne. All right. The preterist view, which means past. And this approach believes... How come it seems so dark in here? Is that dark? Yeah, it seems dark in here to me. Maybe I'm just... Uh, my back's hurting, so it feels dark. But anyways, this approach believes that Revelation dealt only with the church in John's day. In the preterist approach, Revelation doesn't predict they believe anything. John simply described events of his current day, but he put them in symbolic code so as the outside, uh, so those on the outside of the Christian family couldn't understand the criticism of the Roman government. In the preterist view, the book of Revelation was, was for then and then only. Hear this. Um, preterists a lot of times are all millennials too. They can be together. They're not always together, right? Everyone, you have to ask people where they stand because there's so many different views out there. But preterists tends to be with all millennials, and all millennials don't believe in a thousand year reign of Christ. And uh, there's a lot of people out there that, that believe that, sadly. Uh, but uh, we don't believe that. But uh, how many are excited about a thousand year reign of Christ? Amen. We believe that. Then there's the, this is easy for me to say, the historicist view or the historical view. This approach is is the, believes that Revelation is a sweeping, hear this, disordered panorama of all church history. How many know right there, disordered panorama is not a good thing when you call the Bible. I don't like to call the Bible disordered, so I don't really hold to this one too much. But uh, disordered panorama of all church history it, uh, in the historicist approach, Revelation predicts the future, but the future of just the church age, just the church age, not the future of end time events. In the historicist view, Revelation is full of symbols and just, uh, that just describe now the, the age we're in. For example, many of the reformers like Martin Luther called the Pope the beast. They called the Pope the beast of Revelation 13. But they did not necessarily want to believe that the end was near. How many know that? If you, how many old Catholics out there? If you were an old Catholic, you never heard about the end times. You never heard about Revelation. They never taught about it because they just didn't want to believe that the end is near. Maybe, you know, I don't know. Um, but they don't want to believe that. So they believe that the Revelation spoke of their time without necessarily speaking about the end times. Then the third view is, and these are, there's more than this, but these are the basic for the poetic view this approach believes that revelation is a book full of pictures 
and symbols and allegories intended to encourage and comfort persecuted Christians. In John's day, in the poetic or allegorical view, the book of Revelation isn't, hear this, literal. Now how many know this? We always take the scripture literally unless it's obvious it's not literal, right? It, it, you know, I forget the sense. If the literal sense makes sense, seek no other sense. Do you get that? Now when it says that Jesus or it says in Psalms that God covers us with his wings. How I many know that doesn't mean Jesus is, or God's a chicken, okay, or a, or a hen? But it's a, that's an allegory. But that's something we'd say, okay, he's, that doesn't mean he's a bird. But you see what I mean? But when it says things like he's the lamb of God, it doesn't mean he's a lamb, but it's a picture that he, like a humble lamb that was shed, his blood was shed for us. It's an allegory, a picture. But when the Bible makes, when the literal sense makes sense, we always take the literal sense at face value. Does that make sense to you? <laughs> sense about sense? Okay, all right. So they believe it's just an allegorical view. The book of Revelation isn't to be taken literal it's, it, or historic. Revelation is just a book for personal encouragement and personal meaning. But the fourth view, and that's what we kind of hold to more, the futurist view. Amen? We believe it talks about the future. The approach believes that the beginning of, with chapter 4 of Revelation deals with what? The end times. That's why I think when I said, how many of you want to hear about Revelation? I'll be going, oh, because all of you want to know what we're headed for, what we're doing, what's coming. Amen. Don't you? How many like to be aware of what's going on? Right. I don't like to be blindsided. You know, the only surprise I like is maybe a birthday surprise, but that's it. Right. I don't like to be surprised, especially with bad things. Right. So we want to know. So the the it deals with the end times, the period directly preceding Jesus' return. In the futurist view of Revelation is a book that mainly describes the end times. Which approach is correct? Hear that. We all want to know which is correct. Each one is true in some regard. The book of Revelation did not speak, I'm sorry, did speak to John's day, and it speaks to church history, and it does have meaning for our personal life to comfort us. So while, while elements of the first three approaches have their place, we can't deny the place of the fourth view, which I believe is the main the view that we should take, the futurist view. We can know the book of Revelation speaks with clarity about the end times because of two central principles we already studied in our last teaching. And hear this, if you, didn't, you weren't here at the beginning of the book of Revelation, then we have everything online. So look online, you can get caught up if you just came here today and you haven't. But it's, there's two central principles drawn from Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. First, we believe the book of Revelation must have meaning. This book is a book that Jesus said he gave us. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ to show his servants what's going to happen in the last days. It isn't a book of meaningless nonsense. How many know Jesus doesn't tell us things just to waste time, right? He's not like a lot of preachers where he just wants to talk. I mean, when he says something, it has real meaning. It's not just meaningless nonsense. It has promise of blessing, not promise of confusion. How many know confusion is of the enemy? Have you noticed that in life? I've been dealing with that a lot lately. When you talk even to Christians and just everything seems so confused. How many know that's a good sign that the devil's close by? When everything just doesn't make sense, when you're counseling people and, and he said, she said, and never can get to the nitty gritty, usually who's behind that? The devil, because he is the God of confusion. He, that's what he does. He confuses. He makes people confused and makes everything kind of muddied. We also believe that Revelation definitely claims to contain predictive prophecy. John made it clear in verse 1, what he say? Things which must shortly take place. Now, some of you, I said in my last message, I said this, what? Shortly take place. How many know it's short for God? It's only been two days, right? Two days. A day is like a thousand years, and a day, a thousand years is like a day. So it's only been two days. Now for us, it's been two thousand years. That's a long time, right? But it's been only two days. So hey, God's saying shortly will take place. But He says these things which must shortly take place, and that's and we're how many know we're sooner to the end times today than we've ever been. Now I'm not going to say when because we're not to know the day or the hour, but we can know the seasons. And how many know we're a lot closer today than we were a thousand years ago? Amen. So we know that. So. And, you know, I love what my old Baptist friends used to say when I was in Baptist Bible College. They said, live like the Lord could come back today, but plan like he's not coming back for 100 years. Amen? So, you know, don't, don't, you know, don't run up your credit card and say, the Lord's coming back next week. You know, <laughs> live responsible, but live ready. 
because I love what it says. I believe it's, uh, I always get it mixed up. I think it's First John 4, 4. It says, all those who have this hope, the hope of the Lord's return, will keep themselves what? Pure, just as he is pure. How many of you need that? If you know dad's coming home soon, you're going to not throw big parties and do sinful things. Amen? So we need to make sure that we know that God, daddy, is coming home soon. So we need to be ready for, his, for him to rapture us. Verse 3 also says this in Revelation 1, for the time is near. How many excited about that? With my back feeling like this, I want the time to be right now, right? Because it's, uh, but he says the time is near. And, we, and don't we just kind of intuitively know that? Don't you just kind of feel that? You know, and I love people who say, well, but people have been feeling this forever. But how many know this? I want to say this. Everyone who's had this hope of the Lord's return, they're, they're the most uh, evangelistic, the most holy, the most zealous Christians there are. Now, did you hear me? Now, how many of us? I was a Catholic. You can put down your own family, amen? You can, right? Now, if someone talks to me, hey, don't talk about my family, but I was a Catholic, so I can do it. How many of you, as a Catholic, I wasn't preaching Jesus. I wasn't living for Jesus. I didn't care. But I also didn't hear about the Lord's return. Amen? But if we believe that the Lord could come back any second, how many know that should spur us on, as what I said, to one, live holy, two, to be evangelizing because we don't want any of our friends or family members to be left behind, and what? To be ready ourselves. Amen. You know, I hear this. I, I want to say this. This is free. But I want our church to not be religious. How many know God hated the religious people? Now, maybe he hates a little wrong. He dis, dislikes strongly. Would you, call, would you say amen to that? When he calls you whitewashed tombs and brood of vipers, and, and when he says you're of your father, the devil, I think he doesn't like religious people. Okay? So, but why? Because they have a form of guidance. They look godly, but they're not really sincere. How many know we're not to be religious? We're to have a sincere, true relationship with God. We're supposed to fear God. We're not supposed to come here, hi, how you doing? but be living like the devil at home. We're supposed to be fearing God. Does that make sense? Because as I said, one of my favorite verses, you want a verse to memorize? Here's a verse to memorize. Uh, Hebrews 4.13. Everything is laid bare before the eyes of the Lord to whom we must give an account. And as I always said, how many remember that, eight, what is it, 70s song? I don't know, or 80s song? I always feel like somebody's watching me and I got no problem. Guess what? His name's Jesus. Right? Don't worry about big brother watching you. Jesus is watching you. So live right because he's watching. And isn't it funny? We're so worried about what the church sees. But I mean, we're a bunch of sinners. We should be worrying about what the holy eyes of God see us do. Amen? Amen? If we really believe in the sovereignty of God, I, I think I told you this, but I'll say it again because it hit me. But remember the Truth Project, Del Tackett said to this guy who was struggling with pornography, he said, you don't believe in the sovereignty of God. And the guy was a Calvin. He said, yes, I do. He said, no, you don't. He says, why? How do you come you say that? He says, you say that you do not struggle with pornography when your wife and children are home. But as soon as they leave, you struggle. That shows you don't fear God. Ooh. Does that make sense? He got quiet there. I think it made a lot of sense. So she guys. Honey, I feel like we should go to a new church. That's what I feel. Yeah. If your husband said that to you when I talk about stuff like that, you need to say, no, this is where we need to be. Right. But anyway, John wrote about events that were still future to him. And so we believe it's a futuristic book. It talks about things that have not yet come, but we can see it all coming back. We see, you know, God, you know, we're going to see in Revelation how God's going to bring back Israel. He's going to minister to Israel. And how many know we've seen that? You know, I, I told you there's some denominations I'm trying not to say names because a lot of you get mad at me when I say names, but there's mainstream denominations right down the road that believe in replacement theology. That basically the, 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 the God is done with Israel and the church has replaced Israel. But I always think it's funny that we got all the blessings of Israel, but we get none of the curses of Israel. <laughs> How many know that? That's called picking and choosing. But guess what? God is not done with Israel. Amen? Yeah. Just like God is not done with you. If you're here today and you're in sin, God still loves you. I was just telling my wife on the way here. How I many We have a lot of sinful people in this church. Yep, but guess what? But guess what? If, if God can change me, he can change you. Amen. And the minute I believe he can't change you is the minute he can't change me. Because how I many I told you? I told you I was a bad boy. You know what I mean? I was bad. And I say that. Hear this. You always tell me people, some people come to me, Pastor Craig, I don't want to hear that you're so bad. 
I don't like it. Okay, well, hear this. You know why I tell you I was so bad? Because I tell you it so that you can see what God has done. I'm not bragging in my badness. I'm bragging that if God could change me, he could change anyone. And here's the other thing I want. I want to always say that I'm a bad guy without Jesus because, hear this, wherever a man thinks he's strong, let him take heed lest he fall. If I always believe that I still have a sinful nature in me, how many, how many know this, guys? You never change your sinful nature here. All you do is crucify your sinful nature and you learn to walk in the Spirit. Because how many know your sinful nature, the, the sinful nature I had 37 years ago, is still ready to party and rock today? Do you understand? Because it never gets re- transformed. It never gets right. The only time we're going to be done with this fight, because it says in James, what our, his, his, uh, the flesh wars with the Spirit. The only time we're going to be free of this fight is when we are raptured or die. Amen? Amen? So just know that. You don't reform the flesh. You don't, all you do is you crucify the flesh and you don't walk in the flesh. Remember, the second favorite, favorite verse is Galatians 5.16. Walk by the Spirit so you not fulfill the lust of flesh. How many like that? Amen. It's saying, it's saying you know, so that's what you do. You don't want to be like your old fleshy self? Then change the channel and walk by the Spirit. It's that simple. How many like that? Amen. You guys awake? You've been so mellow lately. How, I was just like, I need love. Can you give me love? My back's hurting. I was going to quit. You know, I, I was going to call Kevin and say, hey, you preach there, baby. But uh, I know you guys like me way better than Kevin, so I didn't do it. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, let's pray. Father, thank you for this day, and I even thank you for my back pain because uh, I just uh, makes me need you more. And I thank your word says in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul said, when I am weak, then I am strong for God's grace is perfected in weakness. As my son, Cannon, always says, Dad, whenever you're weak or sick or something, you always do great. So maybe that's why God has me always weak before Sundays. But Lord, I thank you. And I I just ask right now, speak through me, Lord. Despite me, despite how I feel, Lord, let me be a vessel that you can speak through, Lord. Not because I'm worthy, not because I'm good, not because I'm strong enough, but Lord, just because I, I yield myself to you, Lord. I give myself to you. I, I am weak without you, but with you, I can do all things. So speak through me, Lord. I pray for everyone here, Lord. I pray for everyone, no matter what they're going through, no matter what pain they're maybe struggling with or, or, or mental anguish, I pray, that, Lord, right now, that you would take this time to speak to them. As, as Samuel said, Lord, speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Let us have that heart that hungers and thirsts for your truths, that really wants not to just be hearers of the word, not just get more information, but Lord, we want to hear your truths so that we can allow your spirit to transform us to where we'll be effectual doers of the word. Bless your people. Bless them now, I pray. In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone agreed, said? Amen. Amen. Verse 4 of Revelation 1. John to the seven churches which are in Asia... Grace to you and peace. Why are there seven churches? Because seven, as you know, is the biblical number of what? Com- perfection or completion. There's seven days in a week. There's seven uh, days and then you rest. There's seven notes in a scale. There's, they marched around Jericho seven times. Seven is a number of completion. And I don't know about you. I don't know if it's because I'm a Christian. I just love the number seven, right? I always love seven. Seven just, I don't know what it is. Seven, I love seven. And I, I'm afraid, um, um, I'm afraid of, uh, uh, um, what is it? Uh, never mind. I was going to tell a joke. I can't even remember it. But it's basically, why is six afraid of seven? There you go. All right. So that was what I was trying to say, but I can't. Anyway. Seven, eight, nine. There you go. Say, Dwayne. One person needed to hear that. Dwayne needed to hear that. See? Anyway, Asia here does not refer to Korea or Japan or Vietnam. It refers to present day Turkey or Asia Minor. So, why was this letter written to the church in Turkey rather than the church in Jerusalem or Rome or Colossae or Antioch? Especially because that's Paul's headquarters. Why wasn't, it, why wasn't it, he to mention those churches? After all, it seems that they would have been much more appropriate choice. So why this, was this letter written to the seven churches in Turkey? Because no, as we'll see, no other churches could have so perfectly painted the picture that they portray. They're going to show us church history from the beginning of the church in Acts 
to the end of the church, and they're going to show in perfect, I believe, order of where the church is. How many know where right now, I believe, as we'll see when we get there, but the last two churches of our time are the church of Philadelphia, which is what we're trying to be, and what does it say? Here's what it says about Philadelphia. They'll be your little strength. Sound like any church you know? Little, strength, small, but he says what? But your God will open the doors that no, man, that no man can shut and shut the doors that no man can open. What it's saying is your power would not be that you're the biggest church or the most powerful or the most politically, you know, have all the political powerhouses in the church or rich people, but your power will be the Lord. How many want that? Amen? You know what I mean? Like I always say, I, I don't mind rich people. I love rich people. If you're rich, I love you. But... Um, but hear this, what I don't like about rich people and powerful people is a lot of times they have the quick pro quo. I, do, I give you this, you do this for me. And how many know I'm not for sale? Amen? Amen. I have one master and that's Jesus. Now if you are rich and successful and powerful and you have a good suggestion that's from God, hey, amen. But a lot of times it's always, a lot of times it's things that are not quite kosher. And I have played that game before. I've done the quick pro quo, sadly. And I didn't respect myself. And by the grace of God, I'm not going to ever do that again. Amen? Because I don't want to be, God said, hey, I want to build this church my way. And how many know God's ways a lot of times are not our ways? And God's ways a little slower than our ways, right? Because, uh, and I told you, I had a rich guy that said, if you'll let me be an elder, this guy gave a lot of money and he made sure I knew it. But this guy said, I'll buy you a church property and I'll buy you a church. And this is the beginning. It was in six months of our church. And I had that choice right then. Because I'd always seen how a lot of times the powerful, rich people had controlled churches that weren't really as godly as they should be, but they were powerful. And the Lord says, what are you going to do? And I knew, and, they, and I said, here's what I said. You want to hear how wicked I am? can I just take the money? Yeah. And then I'll deal with him. And the Lord's like, no, no, no. You take the money, right? You dance with the devil. You got to pay the devil's due. That you know. And I mean, and then I love what this person said. Do you realize what you're doing? And I go, yes, Satan. No, I didn't say Satan. But I said, I go, yes, I do. And he, go, and I go, and he goes, then why are you doing it? I said, because I know God said no. And I, every, I go, I know what I'm doing because everything inside me is screaming not to do it. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times you know when you're doing the right thing, when you're fussed, going, no! Nah! Right? Your, your, you know, your spirit never does, well, your spirit does it. But you know what I mean? You can tell when you're crucifying the flesh because it's like, ah! It's like a kid throwing a temper tantrum, right? You know, and, and isn't that what Paul says? I buffet my flesh daily and I bring it under subjection. You know what that buffet means? I punch my flesh. I give my flesh a black eye. Isn't that, that's not very politically correct, is it? You're not supposed to beat anything. You're not supposed to hurt anything. Yes, Paul says, I buffet my flesh. Pound it. Bang. Shush. Right? How many know we need to buffet, give our flesh a little whoosh, every once in a while? Right? Whoosh, shushy. Right? Because it's naughty, all right? So anyways, where was I? Where was I? Where was I? Where was I? All right. Then he says, grace and peace be unto you. I like this. This is not just a quote of, hey, dude, how you doing? What's up? That's not what this is. Not just a nice little greeting. It has great depth of meaning. How many love that? Everything in the word has great depth. And here's what it is. You see, grace is charis, where we get the word, Greek word charis. It means what? It means grace, unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor. That was the greeting in the Greek. Grace, grace to you, grace, great God's grace. I want to say this real quick, this little side note. I can't, how many are good researchers besides Kevin? Try to find this for me. I couldn't find it. John Corson said this, and I thought it was interesting, but sometimes Johnny, I love John Corson, but sometimes he says things that can't be verified, and uh, that's scary. But um, that was a joke, but it's true. But uh, my clock didn't start. Oh, my. I've got, I just, I got 50 minutes right now. This is awesome. So that's great. That was the Lord saying, just go. Okay. Anyway. Some of you are going, oh. But he says this. He said the Puritans used to say when they first came to America, the Puritans used to say, hi. And they would, that would mean, hi, heaven's high. Isn't that cool? I mean, if this is true, this is really cool. I can't confirm it, so someone else find it. Glenn, find it for me. All right? But so they say, hi, heaven's high. And then the person's response would be what? Hello. Hell is low. Watch out. Now, if that's true, that is awesome. Right? But I, anyway, how many know? Google is very, very spiritual, right? 
<laughs> I love it. Anyway, so I don't know if they're going to write that stuff down, but I couldn't, but he said it, but he didn't give me documentation, so I don't know. I tried to look for it. If you don't do it now while I'm preaching, but later, see if you can find it. But the Puritan supposedly said high, and it means heaven is high. Hello, hell is low, so watch your step. Be careful. I don't know. Even if he's just spiritualized and making stuff up, that is pretty cool. You know, it's just kind of cool that if that was the foundation of our country, that would be really neat if it's true. But anyways, so they would say grace or charis, which is a greeting of unmerited and deserved favor. Grace to you. Then the Hebrew greeting was shalom, which is what? Peace. The combination of two is very powerful because man, hear this, can't really have peace until he understands the grace or favor of God that he has through Jesus Christ. Amen? Do you understand that? People, why do you think so many people drink? Why do you think so many people do drugs? Why do you think so many people do, are sexually immoral? Because they're trying to find peace or escape. Amen? But hear this, no one can really have true peace until they're right with their Creator. Amen? Amen? Perfect example of this. Again, the Truth Project. There was this guy from Stanford University. He was a, a biologist. He's definitely gay. Made it pretty obvious. And he said, he goes, I, he goes, he talked about how he used to be a Christian. And he says, but I, he said, I, sh- I, I believe all this happening by chance is very hard to believe. Here's what he said. It sure beats the alternative. Why would he say that? Because he knows if he's living a lifestyle against the word of God, that you have to what? To have peace, you have to believe there is no God. Isn't that what it says in Romans? Although they knew God, they would not acknowledge him as God. Because why? Because their hearts were evil, right? They, they, she, it's like, lo, la, la, lo, right? So they try to pretend there is no God. But hear this. The, you got it. The way we have peace is because we know we have grace in Christ. And what is grace? Unmerited, undeserved favor. If you've trusted Christ and you've given him your life, then guess what? You have your sins are covered. You don't have to be afraid of what you've done in the past if you're right with God. And then you can have what? True peace. True peace. So here's my point. You cannot truly have peace without understanding the grace of God. And if you're here today and you say, I don't have any peace. I'm tormented with guilt and shame. Then guess what? Jesus is there for you to surrender your life to and let him fill you with his peace. Cleanse you and then let you have peace because you're right with God. Amen? I'll tell you that again. I've said this before. I have done, I've seen a lot of people die. I've done a lot of funerals and I'll tell you there's nothing sadder than going to someone's bedside, especially someone who's supposed to be a Christian and see that there's no peace in their eyes when they're dying. And there's a difference between just pain, right, of sickness And just that terror of death. How many know, even if I have pain, like right now, I still want to be able to smile and say it is well with my soul. I want to be like D.L. Moody when he's dying. He goes, ah, it's glorious. You know, I don't want to be like, you know. And I mean, there's nothing sadder to see. Has anyone seen what I'm talking about? This, this, This is how we used to be. They used to be, I forget what it was. I think it was John Quincy Adams. Was it John Quincy Adams who had a stroke in the Senate? Does anyone know? I promise someone had a stroke in the Senate. But hear this. Here's what they did. He laid on a couch for a day and a half. I sat on the couch he died on. Pretty weird, but I did. It's in the Women's uh, Congress or Council. But he died. And so the, the reporters were watching him because he couldn't leave. He had a stroke. And, and he woke up and he goes, it's, it's good. He said, like, it's great. And here's what they used to say in the papers back in whatever, the 1800s, or I guess it was the 1800s. He said, he died well. Isn't that amazing? Do you know what they meant by that? He died peacefully. He died of a stroke. That's not well, but he died like he was like, this is good. How many like to die well? I would like to die well. I don't want to die. (laughs) I don't want to do that. I want to be in pain. "Ah, I'm excited. "Ah, My back. Ah, I'm excited. Right? I want to maybe have pain, but not have fear. That's it, I guess I should say. There you go. All right, middle of verse 4. From from him who is, who was, and who is to come, that's talking about God the Father, and from the seven spirits, that's talking about the Holy Spirit, we'll get into that in a second, who are before his throne, 
Verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Do you see the Trinity there? Do you see the Trinity? Isn't it amazing? Like I said, you've heard me say this before. Remember what Jesus said, Father, thank you that you've hidden these things from wise and learned men and revealed them in the babies. How many know God sort of hides the Trinity? He does. But yet, it's very clear if you read the Bible, it's in there. Amen? He, he kind of, the common man doesn't see the Trinity. Someone, how many know the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, the natural man does not discern the things of the Spirit. So you have to see with the Spirit to go all of a sudden. But if you look right here, from him, from him who is, who was, and who is to come, there's God the Father, and then the seven spirits, there's the Holy Spirit, and then verse 5, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. You hear the Trinity there. Amen? And then he says, um, from, from him who is and was and is to come, this is God the Father. And hear this, remember when Moses said to God, what is your name? Remember that? He said, what is your name? Exodus 3, 14. And what did God say? I am that I am. How many love that? Do you know what God's saying there? I am the eternal now. Remember what Jesus said? I, my father is the God of the living, not the dead. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of every generation. Because hear this, Einstein said this, that if you travel at the speed of light, there is no time. Do you remember that? How many remember that in school? There is no time. There's no past. There's no present. There's no future. There's no time, space, continuing. When you travel at the speed of light, you have no time. How many know we have time? But hear this. God is what? Light. And so because God is light, there is no time. So hear this. This will blow your mind, this, but this is beyond our pay grade. Some of you are going, I don't know about this, but hear this. God is with Adam and Eve right now. God is with us right now. God is with us dying right now. We are now in heaven with God. <laughs> Whoa, that's pretty trippy, right? I mean, that's pretty, what? You know, and the only way to try to see it in a natural view is look at God like he's the Goodyear blimp. Not he is the good, but he's in the Goodyear blimp, and he's looking at Adam and Eve in the last person on earth, and he's seeing it all at once. Does that make sense? So he's not going, oh yeah, yesterday, Adam and Eve. It's now. Isn't that cool? You want to hear another thing that's cool about that? Think of this. When you die, you know there's the, the, there's the big thing, uh, I think it's the Seventh-day Adventists, and maybe Jehovah's Witness, I think it's Seventh-day Adventists, but they believe in soul sleep, that you're in the dirt for, you know, Paul's still in the ground right now. But why would Paul say, right, why would Paul say to live as Christ, to die as gain? He wasn't that tired where he wanted a 2,000 year dirt nap, right? So to be absent from the body is to what? Be present with Christ. But hear this, but you go, wait a sec. So, and then people say, so if I die, my body's in a grave, then how do I have, do I have just my spirit in heaven? How do I get my heavenly body? Hear this, because time is now, your body is right now. And you know what's neat too? When you die, you're with all your loved ones. Because they're already done. You're in heaven. There's no more time. Isn't that neat? So you're not going to be in heaven going, <laughs> now isn't it funny? I say that all the time. Oh, your mom and your dad are probably praying for you. No, they're not. They're, they're, you're right there with them. Because there is no time. Isn't that crazy? Now there's time for us, so that just messes us all up. But when you go to heaven, no more time. You're like God. You're not God. You're like God. And there's no more time. Does that mess your mind a little bit? Good. I hope it did. Anyway, so here you go. So I am that I am, the eternal now. God answered, and this is called, here's another big word, tetragrammaton. Tetragrammaton. I can't even really say it. Tetragrammaton. This became so sacred to the Jews, saying I am or Yahweh, that they could only write the consonants. They would only write Y-H-W-H. We don't even know the real correct name of God. Because they were so afraid to say it in a blasphemous way or take it profanely, lightly, that they just did the consonants. So a lot of scholars believe it's Yahweh or Jehovah, but we don't really know how to spell the name of God. Isn't that wild? Do you see the fear of the Lord back then? How many know we need to get the fear of the Lord, right? We, go, we use the Lord's name in vain. Sometimes people as Christians do. We need to be afraid to even, I mean, they were afraid to write it. They would write one letter, wash their hands. Another letter, wash their hands, because they were so afraid to take lightly the things of God. And how many know, I love the old King James word. Remember it says, do not have a profane spirit. Now I just thought, what, when I read that, what does it mean? Cussing spirit? What does that mean? Profane spirit means what? Taking lightly the holy things of God. How many know we should not take his name lightly? Amen? This, uh, 
This describes God as the Lord over all eternity. It's not because He's the what, who was, who is, and is to come. It's never enough just to say that God is, or that God was, or that He is to come. As Lord over all eternity, He rules the past, the present, and the future. He is the God of the eternal now. And that should give us great peace. Because that means whenever we go through a trial, God's not going, oh, what happened? Right? He knows. He's already seen it. Your life is already finished. You're already seated in heavenly places, the Bible says. You're done. If you're a Christian, you're in heaven. Amen? So rest in that. Now don't rest in that be a sloth. Rest in that to live radically for God because I'm already secure. Right? How you know? That's what grace is supposed to do. Grace isn't supposed to make you sin. Grace is supposed to say, I am so free and I'm so blessed in Christ that now I am free to live with all my heart because I am secure. Right? How many know when you're a perfectionist like I am and you're always trying to do things perfectly, you freak out sometimes and it makes you worse, right? Like if you say, if someone's on you, like, okay, come on, the test, okay, we got five minutes, you're like, ah, you know, red wire, yellow wire, red wire, you know, you freak out. But when you know you're secure in God, you're free to live. You're free to say, I am not having to perform, but I'm doing it because I am secure and I love him. Amen. You get it? So there you go. Then he says, um, he says uh, the seven spirits here. Now that can sound weird. There's a lot of cults that do weird stuff with this and seven spirits. And Benny Hinn, I, here I'm mentioning a name, but he did do this, so I can say it. He, he doesn't ashamed of it, but Benny Hinn believes, hear this, this is why you got to really read your Bible. He believes in really nine people of the Trinity because he believes that, that each person of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, has tr- a Trinity within themselves. So God the Father has a Trinity. God the Son has a Trinity. God the Holy Spirit. How many of you know nine people of the Trinity? I don't see that in the Bible. And even here, we only have seven. But do you see what I mean? So you got to be careful with that. You know, you got to. You know, it's like, I mean, you know, if the if the common, if the literal sense makes sense, that's great. But here's another saying that we used to say in Bible college: Don't spiritualize, or you tell spiritual lies. All right. Don't 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 try to grab something that isn't there. If it's not clear in Scripture, don't say it. I've learned that in life. That's why when Pastor, when John Corson, who I love dearly, says about heaven is high and heaven, I've quoted people at times, and then I found out I was totally wrong. And how many know when we look at a commentator, we kind of need to check it out a little bit, amen. Especially as a pastor, because I mean, it goes over the radio, and people say, "Hey, Pastor Craig told me this," and I don't want to be wrong on that. So, anyways. So what is the seven? What is this seven spirits? Well, here it is. It's, it refers to the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit, as seen in Isaiah eleven one through two. Here it is talking about Jesus. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. Who was Jesse? He was what? David's father. So here, where did Jesus come from? The line of Jesse came from. David, King David's line, right? Now, he didn't really come from, but his human body came through that, right? Joseph and Mary, or Joseph, so it came through that. So the stem of Jesse and the branch shall grow out of his roots. That's talking about Jesus. Here it is, verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord shall, hear this, verse 1, rest upon him. How many remember? The Holy Spirit, what? Came upon Jesus in his baptism and rest upon him. There it is, rest. There's number one. Number two. Uh, the spirit of wisdom. How I know Jesus had wisdom, right? He had incredible wisdom. He spoke, as they said, as one with authority. And he had understanding. There it is again, with authority. And then the spirit of counsel. He had counsel. He's, all, he's a great counselor. And then might. We saw the incredible miracles, right? And might. Think about the might, too. Don't you love this? He was able to cleanse the temple with just making a little whip out of rope. And here are these big temple guards, and they got so scared that they actually just let him do what he wanted to do. Isn't that pretty cool? There's some might right there. And then the spirit of uh, six, the spirit of knowledge. And then seven, the fear of the Lord. Again, how many know we need to have the fear of the Lord? We need to have fear. Remember what Jesus said? He says, zeal for my father's house consumes me. He said, my father's house should be a house of prayer, not a den of thieves. Right? He cared about the holiness of God, and so should we. We should fear uh, we should have the fear of the Lord to not want to do things that would grieve, grieve Him or dishonor Him. It isn't that there's seven different spirits of God. Rather, the Spirit of God has these awesome characteristics and has, uh, um, Jesus had them all in the fullness of His perfection. How many know 
the Holy Spirit showed his seven ministries through the life of Jesus perfectly. And I don't know about you, but how many of you would like to walk in that, right? How many of we can, remember I said a couple weeks ago, everything Jesus did, we can do. Did you hear that? Now that almost sounds blasphemous, doesn't it? But Jesus didn't cheat. Jesus didn't say, he didn't just go, I'll just walk on water because I'm God. He was God, but remember the kenosis from Philippians 2? He, he, although he was God, he did not choose equality with God, but he emptied himself. That's the word kenosis. It means like he dimmed down. Remember, he dimmed it down. And how do we know that? From the transfiguration. Remember when he showed himself as he is? All of a sudden, he, it's like shined as bright as the sun. And they fell down. They were like, whoa. Perfect example of this too, we'll see in this chapter of Revelation, what happens when John, who used to snuggle with Jesus, remember he used to put his head in his lap, and all of a sudden he sees the glorified Jesus, what happens? Whammo! He falls down like a dead man and has to be left, lifted up because how many know that's how awesome and mighty your God is. You're not going to be going up to heaven when you first get there and high five Jesus. What's up? No, you're going to be, help me up. That's what you're going to be saying. No, you know, that's, that's about all you're going to be saying. Anyways, does that make sense to you? So the seven, the, seven, the seven ministries of the Holy Spirit and it's all seen in the life of Christ. But because we can be like Christ, Right? Not be Jesus, but be like him, because he did it. Everything Jesus did, he did it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? Every time he did a miracle, through the power of the Spirit, just like us. Every time he walked on water, everything he did was through the Spirit. So we can do it. Remember what Jesus said? These things and greater should you do. I don't believe we're going to do greater works than Jesus. Some of the charismatics will say, oh, greater. No, no, no. We're going to just be greater, I believe, in number. Amen? I don't think I'm going to beat Jesus, right? I don't think I'm just going to walk around. You're not going to see me cleaning my pool, walking on it. You know, just I'm not going to do that, right? Not going to happen. But, you know, if I needed to walk on water, I believe if Jesus wanted me to, or God did, I could walk on water. Amen? Do you believe that? I, I could. We could. We could do that. But do we need to do it? That's the key. All right? Does that make sense to you? And then uh, here it is. Verse 5 again. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. John 4, 8 through 9 says this. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Verse 9. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? Excuse me. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, basically, Philip, show us the Father. How can you do that? Hear this. Jesus is the perfect picture of the Father. Now, isn't this wild? Can I hear this? How many believe Jesus is very loving? I mean, I mean, I mean. But sometimes we get this weird view that somehow Jesus is the nice, hippie, loving, you know, Godhead, and the Father, God the Father, he's like the old, cranky, Old Testament God. Kill them! Plagues! Wipe them out! Right? <laughs> but did you hear what he just said? He said, if you see me, You've seen the Father. So guess what? That means God the Father is as loving or just as loving as Jesus. Amen? Amen. And if you look at the Old Testament, people say, but man, didn't God wipe a lot of people out in the Old Testament? Yeah, but he also gave a lot of grace in the Old Testament too. Remember the picture he showed? Remember the picture? What did he show? Uh, of uh, Hosea? With Gomer, the prostitute, marry the prostitute, chase the prostitute. And then what happens? So this honorable man marries her like God, or a picture of God's love and patience. And then what happens? She then leaves him again. So what does he have to do? He has to wait in line for his wife, who's a prostitute, and then he has to redeem her or buy her back. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a pretty loving God to me. right? If my wife was a prostitute and she did it multiple times, I probably would not wait in line to buy her back. Amen? Anyone want to say a sad amen? I wouldn't be like, hey, you know, how many, what's the line here? You know, I would be like, what? I would go to the head of the line and get either now or I'm done, right? But that's how patient, how merciful your Father, Heavenly Father is. Hear this too, I want to say this real quick because I just want us to blow that weird conception away. How many know Jesus, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, sweating great drops of blood, anticipating what the cross meant. I mean, I don't think it was the, the pain of the cross that Jesus was kind of woe about. It was the separation from the Father. And second, hear this, hear this. It was being immersed in all the sin you've committed and everyone's committed. Hear that. I love what Chuck Swindoll said. It says that he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. He didn't sin. He became, he, he took our sin. 
That means he was baptized or immersed in every sin you've ever done, every sin I've ever done, every child molester's done, every murderer, every rapist, you name it, he had to be bathed in it. Does that kind, do you get the picture? So he's like going, Father, is there any way that I can save these people without having to go to the cross? And we don't hear the answer, but how we know the answer was no. So do you see that? What does it say, John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he what? Gave. Love gives. He gave. He said, I got to give my son because he's the only one that can do this. He gave. And then hear this. Romans 8, 32 says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? If you're ever not sure God loves you, if you ever feel like, oh, God doesn't love me, then look to the cross. God loved you and I so much that he gave his son for your sins and mine. And hear this, guys. This is why I fight so hard of cheap grace, of just saying, oh, grace, I can do whatever I want. How many know it might have been free for you and I, but it wasn't free for Jesus? It cost him everything. It wasn't free for the Father. Could you imagine laying your life, laying your child's life down, your son's life down for ungrateful people? That should make us who understand it very grateful to say, I'm never going to take lightly your grace. I'm never going to use your grace as a doormat for willful sin. Amen. Grace should be, that was a weak amen, but grace should be when we sincerely fail. That's what grace should be as a Christian. It should never be, hey, grace, 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 who cares? It costs God dearly. Amen? Dearly. So Jesus, therefore, is the faithful witness of the Father. So guess what? When you see Jesus and you read the gospel, you say, man, he's so loving, he's so great. The woman caught in adultery. you got to say, that's my heavenly Father also. That's the Holy Spirit also. That's not, you don't separate the Godhead. Remember I told you people have said that to me? Oh, I love the Father. I love Jesus, but that Holy Spirit. <laughs> you can't do that, right? He's crazy. No, that's part of the Godhead, right? That's like saying, that's like I say, that's like say, hey, Pastor Craig, I love you and I love most of your family. That Candon, oh my goodness, he stinks. You hate Candon? <laughs> I'm not going to be happy with you, right? He's part of my family. Well, how do we know? You, you say, I love the Father, I love the Son, but the Holy Spirit's nutty, or Jesus, or the Father's mean. I love the Spirit, I love Jesus. You can't separate them. They're all one and they all reflect each other. They have different roles, but yet the same. And guess what? Their love is the same. Right? It isn't like Jesus saying, Daddy, please be nice to them. Think about it. It was Jesus who was thinking, if there's any way out of this, I ain't doing this. And it was the Father who said, hey, son, you have to do this. This is the only way. Amen? Does that make sense to you? So I want you and I to know that we know that we know that the Father loves us just as much as the Son loves us. Middle of verse 5. It says, the firstborn from the dead... Let me say this. I didn't have this in my notes, but I think it's important. How many have had uh, Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons come at your house and knock and want to tell you about a different gospel? Yeah. And how many know now they're saying, oh, we're Christians just like you? No, 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 and no. Here's the why. They'll use this verse right here. They'll say, you see, look at this. Firstborn or begotten from the dead. So that means Jesus was created. You ever hear that? Has anyone heard that? Anyone got a, wit a Mormon witness to you or a Jehovah's Witness? They'll say that. So they'll say that that, that shows he was born. But hear this, that is not what that's saying. It wasn't like Jesus the firstborn of the dead. It wasn't saying he's the first. It's saying not a position or a birth order, but it's saying preeminence. He's preeminent over everyone born. He's preeminent. He is God Almighty come in the flesh. Let me give you an example of this. The firstborn son of the Jewish family had preeminence, man. Didn't matter how much, they always had preeminence. They always got the first, they were the apple of their father's eye. They always got the inheritance. Preeminence, the firstborn. That's what he's saying here. The Jews, the Jewish priests, when they talk about the Messiah, they always call him the firstborn son of God. They call him that. But hear this, another analogy, analogy is this. Ivanka Trump, what's her title? The first lady. Now, does that mean she's the first woman ever created? No. Or what's it, what did I say? Well, oh, I'm sorry, daughter. Yeah, yeah. Weird people say he likes his daughter, but anyway. Okay. But anyway. So, uh, yeah, Melania, the foreign woman, right? Okay, Melania. They're saying they call her the first lady, right? 
But that doesn't mean she's the first woman ever created. That means preeminent. She is the second most powerful. She's, well, husband's first, right? He's the most powerful man, they, they say, in the world a lot of times. But his wife is the most powerful woman of our government. Does that make sense? You see the preeminence there. So don't let any Mormon or Joe Witness say, oh, I see, God was not. See, Jesus wasn't uh, a creator. He was a creation. He's just the son of God. He's good, but he's just the son of God. No. What did Jesus say? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Not a creation of the Father. You've seen the Father. The Father and I are what? One. I always like to say, I don't know if that's in John, is that in John 8 or John 10? It's, they're bo- read both those chapters. But it's so neat because he says, remember he says, before Abraham was, I am. And it says, they picked up rocks to kill him. And he says, for what sin are you stoning me? And he says, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. So guess what? The people of Jesus' age knew exactly what he was saying. When you say, I am, the Tetragrammaton, you are saying, you are God. So Jesus never said, hey, I'm just his son. You know, no, Jesus Christ is God Almighty come in the flesh. All right? He says, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth to him who loves us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. How many like that? Washed us from our sins in his own blood. I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful that the Lord didn't just whitewash our sins, but rather through the shedding of his blood, he washed us as white as snow. How many are thankful for that? When I first started construction, I didn't know anything. I didn't have a dad, so I just kind of learned as I went, kind of like Kevin. And uh, and I just, I just, I'm joking because he does our maintenance, but I uh, just, I learned the hard way through a lot of trial and error and so one day i was working i told this guy at the apartment complex go oh yeah i'm a maintenance guy i know all about stuff yeah i can take care of it and i didn't know anything so and i'm just learning on his apartment and i remember one day this guy had kicked in a bunch of holes in the walls and uh, low thing so i'm putting all these patches in well i ran out my pencil broke and so i didn't have no pencil i didn't have a pencil didn't have no pencil man that's good english but i didn't have a pencil and so so i started using a, a blue pen now, how many know where I'm going with this, if you know anything? about So I'm writing all over the walls with this pen, all the lists I need to do, all the measurements. So I've written all over this wall, up, down, sideways, of all these things. And so then I'm like, and I'm thinking, man, I'm really ahead of schedule. I'm going to really impress this guy. So then I paint it, and I leave, and all of a sudden, the guy comes back to me and says, what is going on here? And I'm like, what are you talking about? I did the perfect job. Everything was great. And all of a sudden, all that I wrote was bleeding through. Ink, you do not write. That's why you always use a pencil with carpentry. But uh, so all my blue ink was coming through. So I had to use kills, you know, that kills paint. I had to do that. I mean, boy, how many are glad that Jesus doesn't just cover your sin where it just kind of bleeds through and everyone goes, what is that? Oh, my goodness. You know, that it's not just a whitewash, but he truly washes you. David, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know, when I was a college kid, we used to t- I used to call it a quick shower where you just, you know what I mean, you don't change your clothes, you just do a little you know, armpit and spray, right? Anyone do that? Anyway, uh, so yeah, God doesn't do that. Anyway, Isaiah 1.18 says this, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. How many love that? Washed. But hear this. We need to confess our sins to be washed and we need to hear this renounce them i believe most people christians walk around in just as much guilt and shame a lot of times as the world because guess what they are sorry for their sins but they don't really confess and renounce their sin let me give an example the bible says in corinthians i'm not sure where right now but it says godly sorrow leads to what repentance but worldly sorrow leads to what death I believe worldly sorrow, here's worldly sorrow. Oh man, I really feel bad. I'm sleeping with my boyfriend. Well, I hope not. Not my boyfriend. But I, I'm sleeping with a boyfriend. Or I'm sleeping with a girlfriend. Or I really feel bad I'm committing adultery on my wife. Or I really feel bad I'm looking at pornography. But we're not doing anything to stop it. Amen? That's worldly sorrow. That leads to death. So I feel bad. And, but I say, oh, I'm just, you know, I, I'm sorry, God. But help me know, can, can anyone be real here? You know when you're really repenting of sin or when you're just sorry for sin, don't you? Right? If I say, oh, I'm really sorry, I struggle with drinking, and I hide a bottle after I repent under my bed, how many know I didn't really repent? Amen? I love what A.W. Tozer said it this way. 
He said the man or woman of God is like going down a dark tunnel towards God. He's the light going towards God in this tunnel. And the godly man or woman is blocking off all the exits from God. Isn't that good? Do you hear that? So how many know there's a lot of things trying to say, come over here, go over here, right? And the godly man or woman blocks it off. Let me give you an example. How many saw the movie Fireproof? Remember the movie Fireproof? Remember the husband? He's trying to be all lovely with his wife, and she's like, remember that? Why? Because he's looking at internet pornography. How many know it's really, it's really hard for you guys to make your wife feel real love when they know you're looking at other women? Got quiet all of a sudden, didn't it? But what did he do that I thought was so cool? And I'm not even a woman, but I thought it was pretty cool. I was, oh my goodness. Right? But what did he do? He smashed his computer. Remember the guy next door? Never stay away from that guy. But he smashed his computer. Remember that? And he put a rose and he put a card and he said, I love you more. How many know we need to do that with God? I love you even more than our wife. I love you. That's why I don't do this. Because I love you. Not because I fear like, oh, oh. I do it because I love you. I don't want to hurt you. Does that make sense? But a lot of people say, oh, I feel bad. And they just go and they don't take any... See, the Bible says in Proverbs, if we confess, he who conceals his sin says will not prosper, but he who confesses and renounces, that means to turn away from, renounces sin will find what? Mercy. How many could use some mercy? I could use mercy every day. But we got to turn. And most people just say, oh, I'm so sorry. But I, So I told this one guy who's struggling with internet pornography, very powerful guy, he's still in ministry today around this city. It's pretty sad. And uh, very prominent on the radio. And uh, I, said, uh, I said to him, um, you need to do something on the internet to protect yourself from this. And he goes, I can't. And I said, why can't you? He goes, my job, I need the internet. I said, well, put a filter on, put a kind of, yeah, I can't, I can, I'm so good, I can hack through it. You remember the old saying, my grandma used to always say, if there's a will, there is a way. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you're serious with God, and how many of God's pretty serious about sin? What did God say? If your right hand caused you to stumble, what? Cut it off. I mean, if you see me with no hand, you'd be like, whoa, right? That's not, that's not a little thing. You know, I, I, I cut my nails real short. No, that's forever, right? And, and he says, in one version, he says, if your right foot, chop it off. I mean, if you saw me with a peg leg every day, how you doing? You'd be like, oh my goodness, that's pretty radical. And if you saw what your right eye caused you to pluck it out. And what did Jesus say? It's better to enter heaven maimed than to enter hell with a perfect body. So do you hear my point? Do you hear the point? Well, not my point. Jesus' point. He's saying, do whatever it takes to cut off sin. But guess what? That doesn't preach today because, you know, if it doesn't, you know, and Grace, Craig, it shouldn't cost me anything. Chopping off your hand or foot or eye, I think, is a pretty big cost. Right? Now, it's a metaphor, right? Don't know if you come here tomorrow and go, how you doing? No. Aye, aye, matey. I'm living for Jesus. No. But you get the point, right? He's saying, do whatever it takes. If you need to smash your computer, how many, do you remember living, how many old people like me remember living without a computer? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I miss the day. And I don't miss the studying. I used to, remember that, books all over the place? I mean, it's so nice. That, if, if we had no computer, <laughs> my sermons would be way shorter, trust me. Okay? <laughs> I could go through three or four chapters a day, <laughs> like in 40 minutes, right? Maybe you should pray. The computer fails. We have, a, we have an EMP that wipes it all out. But anyway, but I'm just saying is that's the only part I miss. But there's so many, how many know? Pornography has now, when I was, I always say it, I'm going to say it again. I had to work hard to get pornography when I was a kid. I'm 55 years old. Now you have to work hard, hard, hard not to get pornography. I've talked to three women this week in our church that struggle with pornography. 20 years ago, you didn't hear about women struggling with pornography. It's a, now it's a normal thing. And the rates are going up higher and higher and higher. Because why? We're becoming so sexualized. Even women. And women aren't as visual as men are. But that's because why? A spirit of lust. And hear this, guys. I don't say this to condemn you. I say this to help you. To say, how can we really see the power? Hear this. Do we believe that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore? then guess what? If it's not working today, guess what? We're doing it wrong. It ain't Jesus. It ain't, you know, we want to say, I tried and Jesus ain't working. 
It ain't working because we ain't taking radical steps. And hear this. So confession is what? It's confessing it, agreeing with God, hey, what I'm doing is wrong. But it's also saying, forgive me. And here's the key that very few people do. Now I'm going to do whatever it takes to not give place to that. The Bible says, flee youthful lust. The Bible says, give no opportunity for the flesh. Guess what? You cut off your foot. How many know it's going to be a little harder for you to get to the fleshly things, right? It's gonna, you have one eye, you're going to get more tired looking at bad things, right? <laughs> but I don't want any people to chop their foot or leg or hand or anything, but I'm saying, how many know, maybe chop a computer off? Maybe say, I'm never going to do my computer except with my wife right by me. Amen? We're, we, how many, I'm just going to say this. We're old school. We are, we are like Ma, Amish people. We're like, we're like the Godfather. Remember the Godfather first guy? Hopefully you didn't watch it, but if you did... Remember, they would walk with the, 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 the couple with Don Corleone. They're walking, and the, the family's walking behind. We do that with Sarai and Cannon. I'm like, just watching them like this. This is what I do with them in the house. <laughs> hey, get you. Hey, what are you doing? Right? Now, hear this. I want them to fear God because, you know, they can sneak stuff, right? But I want to help them because guess what? Do you know what? I mean, I love when people say, oh, I just love my little princess. I trust them so much. I trust them to be in bed together under the covers. You know, I trust them. I tr- no, you're dumb. <laughs> if Cannon and Sarai were under the covers, God bless them, we'd be having to get married right now. <laughs> Amen? And they love God. Amen. Do you see what I'm saying? I put no confidence in them, and I put no confidence in me, and I put no confidence in you. And we need to say, but this, this baloney, I trust my little pumpkins. You're dumb. You trust them, and yet look at all that you've done. I don't trust my kids because I know what I've done, and I'm pretty sure they're just as sexual as I am with this generation, right? Right? So stop that. Don't play that. I trust them. Say, I trust God in them, and I trust them to walk, but they need to put off the flesh. I do not want them in a room alone together until they're married, right? I do not want them because I don't want to have to be Grandpa Craig before they're married. Okay? Is that keeping it real for you guys? Sorry if you're new. <laughs> okay, so confess it. Ask the Lord for forgiveness of our old sins. But hear this. Maybe, have you ever done that? Have you ever asked forgiveness and you feel cleansed and all of a sudden the next minute the devil or your flesh goes, you remember what you just did. And then the devil says, you're going to do it again. Doesn't the devil do that? Do you ever sin bad? And the devil goes, you've already done it once. You might as well keep doing it. That's like saying, oh, I, I, I got a hangnail here. But hey, it's pretty bad hanging now. I might as well just chop off my finger. That's silly, okay? Isn't that dumb? That's demonic. You, you do something wrong, stop, admit it, and quit it. Don't keep doing it. Don't believe that lie. Oh, it's, or you already messed up. Keep messing up. No. Repent. Turn. God is a God of redeem. He's a redeemer. That means what? He can buy back the wasted years. How many love that? He restores. He's like, he likes to restore old cars, us, old cars. He likes to say, oh, this is messed up, but I can restore it. But we have to partner with him. And here it is. So we confess for sins. But here's a lot of times a devil will come and he'll say, ah, oh, you know, um, he'll say, look at you, you're, you're going to do this again. But hear this. If we confess our sins to God, and then the next minute we say, hey, God, remember that sin I just confessed to you? You know what God will say to you, technically? No. What sin? And you go, what? Yeah. Technically, God will say, what sin? Why? Because he's chosen to remove our sins when we truly confess, when we truly repent. Psalms 103, verse 12 says this. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. Isn't that awesome? It's not like around the globe, east and west coming around again. It's straight line out like a, like a shooting star. It's going away from each other to never, ever find each other. How many like that? That's how good he is. But sadly, sometimes... Our flesh and the devil likes us to go fishing for our past. How many knows that? How many, how many of you ever did this? Maybe I'm the only simple person, but I'll be worshiping here. I'll just be worshiping, starting off, and all of a sudden I'll get a weird thought of my past. Because the devil wants me to what? Feel condemned. The devil wants to say, hey, remember? Remember? And try to get me all caught up in it. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hear this. When the devil tries to remind you, I love this, Chuck Hughes Smith, who says, when the devil tries to remind you of your past, remind him of his future. Okay, what do you, what's going to happen to you? Oh, a bottomless pit, lake of fire. There you go. You know, and remember that. Okay? 
But this says, when we, when we ask for forgiveness, when we truly turn and confess and renounce them and ask for forgiveness, that's why God says this. Here's what God says in Micah 7.19. He says, you, talking about God, will cast all our sins in the depths of the sea. How many like that? I love what one man of God said. He said that God, he called it, he says, the sea of forgetfulness. I think it was A.W. Tozer said that, the sea of forgetfulness. And he says, on the sea of forgetfulness, there's a sign that says, no fishing. Isn't that good? But now hear this, hear this. Let me say this to kind of balance it out. But if you, like I said, repent of pornography and yet you have a playboy under your bed, how many know you really can't enjoy the sea of forgetfulness? Because you haven't really cut off everything. Do you see what I mean? I mean, you know, I don't want to say God helps those who help themselves, but you've got to partner with God. You can't just say I'm sorry and, and give opportunity for it. You've got to say I'm sorry, and I'm so sorry, and I'm repenting to where I'm now going to give no place, and I'm going to cut off all the ways to get to it. It's kind of like the movies. You always see the alcoholic trying to find the bottles everywhere. There should be no bottles in the house. There should be no pornography in the house. There should be no exit. We should try to eliminate every single exit. And guess what? You are your brother's keeper, and you should be trying to help your, 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 your husband, your wife, your kids, and you should be holding all each accountable because we don't trust each other. We know, given our, our, in our flesh and ourselves, we will sin. Amen? Is there anyone here who says, no, I beat sin, Craig. It's all done. Wherever man thinks he's strong, <laughs> let him take, lest he fall. Just now, now let's count the clock how soon until you fall. Right? John 8, 8, 36 says this, Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. How many like that? Yeah. Now, I want to put right here on this wall right here, right there when you come in, I want to put uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And it says, Such were some of you. Remember, before it does all the sins. How many know? I'd like that to be a verse that we live. Such were some of you. Not still are for 45 years. Such were. I used to be a fornicator. I used to be a drunkard. I used to be a swindler. I used to be an adulterer. I used to be whatever, whatever. You put it in what you do. But by the grace and strength of God, I've been set free. 1 John 1 9 says this if we confess our sins, and renounce them, right? It doesn't say that, but that's what that means. Then he says what? He'll forgive us our sins and cleanse us. How many need to be cleansed at times, right? I mean, just cleanse to remember the blood of Jesus that washes us as white as snow. And here's the other thing that's important. Hebrews 10, 22 says this. I'm not going to read the whole verse. You can read it later, but it says, he'll cleanse us from an evil, guilty conscience. How many of us know that sin can sometimes leave us a stain or can leave, I wouldn't say stain, but can leave a memory? And we need to pray, Lord, right? The renewing of our mind to what? Does the Bible say? To the washing of the word. We need to say, God, let your word wash out those, those old thoughts. Wash out those wrong things. Wash off those old friendships or old ties with things so that I can what? Start fresh with you. Because what happens is sometimes, sometimes the devil wears us out and we just say, oh, I keep thinking about it, I keep thinking about it. But have, hear this, 2 Corinthians 10, I don't have the scripture, so whoever's doing the word, sorry. But 2 Corinthians 10 says what? Holding every thought captive and bringing it under the obedience of Christ. That means you need to say, when you have a thought of the past or a thought, you put it under the blood and you say, God, I confess this thought is wrong. Please help and renew and change my mind. Hear this, guys. John Corson says this very well. It, God, you can't change your heart. You can't change what you desire or feel. But hear this. If you'll change your mind and agree with God and his word, if you'll c commit to that choice, then he'll change your heart and mind and desires. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. But you've got to choose. Does that make sense? You've got to choose. I want to end with this, because then I think I went long, but here it is. I don't know, because my timer's way off. But anyway... But here's what I want to end with. I guess I have two more verses. 2 Timothy 2.22 says this, Run or flee from anything that stimulates youthful lust. And how many, isn't it funny all of us old people say, I'm still young. Okay, this applies to you then too, right? Some of you, some of you how many know they say nursing homes are some of the most immoral places now? <laughs> That's good. Okay, but, but you know they say it's some of the most immoral places, Right? 
So guess what? There's some old timers that ain't, you know, they got their Viagra. They still, <laughs> I'm youthful, right? You wake still? That's kind of freaky, but it's true. They're saying that. Run or flee from anything that stimulates youthful lust. Instead, pursue righteousness. Amen. Righteous living, I'm sorry. Faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy, hear this, enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with a pure heart. Hear this, I want to say this real quick, and I'm going to offend. Your best friend should not be a non-Christian. Oh, you can be friends with a non-Christian. You, you can minister to a non-Christian, but you should not be pouring out your heart to a non-Christian because you should have a different... You, you can't trust what a non-Christian says to you. Do you think I should cheat on my husband? Yeah, I think you should. You need to be around people that are going to spur you on to love and good deeds. They're going to encourage you Amen. to go for God. You need to be around people like that. Remember what Jesus said? Who's my friend? Who's my mother and father? Who's my brother and sister? He says, those who do the will of God. That should be your new best friend. We're the people who love God. And guess what? Have you noticed in Christianity? I always say this. If it wasn't for Jesus, a lot of you would not be my friends. You know what I mean? Because I would say, eh, they're not not my style. That's not my type. I'm cooler than that, whatever. Right? I'm being honest. But guess what? I love all you little nerds. Okay? No, okay. No, (laughs) I'm just teasing. I love, I'm a nerd too. But anyways, I, I love that you love God. Amen? Amen? Do you understand that? I love it. And so I love everyone who loves God. And guess what? I don't like cool people that don't love God that think they're cool. Right? Like I said, the rich people that think they're all cool. I love rich people's stuff and I love their homes, but I don't love when they don't love God. Amen? Amen. And with this, sorry, I didn't mean to call you nerds. I'm just saying. I, I'm, well, let me preface that so you would hate me, hate me. When I became a Christian, right before I became a Christian, I thought all Christians were nerds. Now I am one, but I thought I was cool, and I couldn't give in to nerds. But now I love, I, I, I laugh because I'm the nerd, and now I'm part of the nerdery. And <laughs> what I'm just saying is, <laughs> you understand, what I'm saying is, I love those who love God. Does that make sense? So hopefully you don't hate me for that. I didn't mean to sound so prideful. Anyways, Romans 13, 14 says this. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Guys, you will not walk in the clear conscience. You will not walk in the power of the blood if you do not, if you do not take seriously making no provision for the flesh. The reason why the church is so weak, the reason why the church is so, Jesus doesn't seem to work anymore, is because we don't take serious repentance and serious of cutting off sin. Jesus is there to forgive. That comes like that as soon as you confess. But then the hard part is the disciplines to not return to that sin, to cut off some of the relationships, to cut off some of the avenues to go there. That's what we need to be. And you can call it, you can believe the lie of the devil that, oh, that's legalistic. No, that's called what the old timers called it, the old spiritual guys called it spiritual disciplines. Isn't that amazing? If, if I want to get strong and I go, okay, guys, if I say, Soraya, I want to be healthy diet-wise. She's a dietitian or nutritionist. And I say, but I don't want to change my diet. <laughs> and I don't want to exercise. She's going to say, good luck with that, right? But guess what? We need to be willing to change our diet and change how we live, right? We wouldn't, we wouldn't question that with working out, but we question that with the Lord. And I want to tell you, no. I want to tell you this. Can I tell you a little cute joke with with Soraya. I got to pick on them. I don't know why I just pick on Ken and Soraya. She's a nutri- she has a nutrition major and she was saying, Pastor Craig, I can help you with your weight. <laughs> so I hated her right then. But anyway, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. So she says this to me, I can help you with your weight. So I'm like, okay, we're at, uh, what do you call it? Sweet tomatoes. And as she's saying it, she's got two ice cream cones around. She goes, I can help you <laughs> with your weight. I said, I can do that diet right there. I got that down. I, you know, so, so, anyways, so if you need help with that, Soraya's here to help you. See, and it, look at how it's working great. I mean, I'm doing, <laughs> I think I've gained five pounds this last week through that diet. No, anyway, anyway, is that good? Is that all right? Did I do all right despite my back? You got good? But I say this, and, and hear this, guys. It was so neat. Uh, Brent encouraged me. And he says, Craig, I really think this church is ready to explode. And I said, not as, not as long as I can help it. No, I'm kidding. I said, 
But here's what I said. You know what I said? As long as we can maintain discipleship. Do you hear what I just said? As long as you guys, I pray every day, Lord, let this church grow. And I hope you do too. But bring people who want you on your terms, who really want to yield their lives to you. Not perfect, but perfectly yielded to you. Because I don't want fornication to be normal in our youth group. I don't want adultery to be normal in our marriages. I don't want blatant sin to be the normal thing. Because what did the Bible say? A little leaven, little sin, leavens the whole lump. I want to actually be a church that we do our best to be 1 Corinthians uh, 6.11. Such were some of you. How, how many like to live that? Amen. I don't want to be like, I'm just ch- waiting on Jesus for that. No, delivering from that drinking. No. I used to be an alcoholic. I used to be a drug addict. I used to be a fornicator. By the grace and strength of God, he's delivered me from that. Amen. Amen. And that's what I want all of us to be able to say humbly. Not I did it, God did. I yielded to him, he did it. Amen. Let's pray. And if you need prayer, just come up to us afterwards. I'm going to be greeting, but if you need prayer, uh, let us know. We would love to pray with you. (sighs) Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you for giving me the strength to preach even my back. I praise you for that. I ask that, Lord, this message really speaks to us and that it really shows us that forgiveness is instant, the cleansing is instant, but the turning, the discipline to really flee youthful lust, to give no provision for the flesh, that, that's the, the day-to-day. And so, God, I pray for everyone here, whatever their struggle is or whatever our struggles are, that we'd realize we are forgiven, we are cleansed when we confess it, but the way we walk, not continue in it, is by cutting it off, by throwing out the wine bottles or the the whiskey bottles, by throwing out all the avenues of pornography, putting blocks on our computer, maybe even saying, I won't be on the computer without my wife. But Lord, let us take serious. Let us hear your word, Jesus. Your loving words that said, if your right eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. Now, that's not saying actually physically pluck, of course, your eye out, but it's saying take the radical steps to cut off looking at things that are impure. Take the radical steps to cut off your right hand to not touch the things that are impure. Take the radical steps to cut off your foot to not walk towards walk by places that cause you to sin like a strip club or, or hooters or something weird like that or a bar. Lord, I ask that you'll give us the forgiveness that will feel that cleansing of your precious blood, will feel that, 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 that cleansing of our guilty conscience, but I also pray that your blood and the power of your precious Holy Spirit, the power of your name, Jesus, would give us too to realize that, that the, the forgiveness is quick, it's instant, but the discipline to not walk in that continued sin, that's the day-to-day. That's what takes discipline. That's what takes daily prayer. And that's what takes that, that, I don't know if you would call it, due diligence to not give provision or place for the flesh. Let us be very practical Christians. Let us not let the devil in this world and even the worldly church say, oh, you have disciplines, that's legalism. No. Legalism is doing this and this and this to be righteous. We're doing this because we want to love you and the way we show you we love you is by not continuing in willful sin. So God, please purify your church. Help us to take you serious. Help us to be our brother and our husband and wife's keeper, not sin sniffers, but really loving each other. Really, as you said, I believe, through Paul and Hebrews, spur one another on to love and good deeds. Please, Lord, let us be the Philadelphia church. Maybe we're not the biggest church. Maybe we're not the most influential church. But we are a church that has your strength, that you are the God who can open doors that no man can open. And you are the God who can shut doors. And I pray that, holding on to that verse, shut the doors in our lives that are not of you. Amen? Can you say that with me? Amen? Shut all the things that lead away from you, all the pornography, all the alcohol, all the relationships, all, you name it, whatever it is, we give you permission, we ask you humbly, shut the doors. Block off those exits away from you. And Lord, open doors 
that are going to encourage us. They're going to spur us on, build relationships in this church where we'll lovingly love you and then hold each other accountable with your love. Thank you, God. Bless your people. Deliver us from evil. Change our lives that we can say, such was I. I, Such were some of you. I used to be this, but by the grace and strength of God, he delivered me. Amen? We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.